Hello, so welcome back to this lecture series on digital communication using GNU radio. My name is Kumar Appaya and I belong to the Department of Electrical Engineering, IIT Bombay. So this will be the last of our series of lectures on demodulation, uh, at least with respect to the theoretical part. So in this lecture, we will see a little more about MRE signal demodulation and subsequently we will now move to checking these methods out and you know, check, you know checking out how these methods work on GNU radio. To recall in the last lecture we saw a detailed discussion of on off signaling that is binary signaling where the two signals that are being sent are either 0 or S of t. And in this particular mode of signaling we found that we could perform an analysis of the optimal detection scheme and find the symbol error rate also. There is one minor remark that I wish to make. We chose our decision rule based on this particular quantity which is S over here and using S we plotted our PDFs and we found the decision region on S to be norm S square uh, which should be to the left or right of norm S square and so on. There is a slight modification also that I wanted to talk about. If you remember we mentioned this, this psi of t as a normalized version of S of t can also be used and can also serve as a decision me mechanism. So just to, just to give you some perspective, if you now look at our z, if we define it as y comma s, instead if you define u to be inner product y comma let us say psi, in this case you are going to get another metric u which is basically the same as saying this is z upon norm s it makes no other difference. But if you repeat the analysis with u, you will get some things which are slightly different because if you now look at our relationships with we, which we had with u, for example, expectation of z given, sorry, the relationships with z, expectation of z given at 0 is expectation of n comma s which is 0, variance of z given at 0 is going to be covariance n comma s n comma s this with u is going to undergo a slight and interesting change. If you say variance of u under h0, this is equal to covariance of angle bracket in the case of h0, y is just n, n comma u, sorry, n comma psi. comma n comma psi. Using our formula that covariance of n comma v1, n comma v2 is sigma square angle bracket v1, v2, this will become sigma square angle bracket psi comma psi which is equal to sigma square. Similarly, if you find the variance of u under h1, it will also turn out to be sigma square. And in this particular scenario, if you basically draw the PDFs under hypothesis H1 and H2 for u, okay, this will say H1, H0, both should have the same height, I am sorry, just you know. In this case, things undergo a slight change because if you now look at, of course, I should have calculated the mean also. If you now calculate the mean of u under H1, so, expectation of u under h1 is equal to expectation of and we would have calculated angle bracket y comma psi, okay. But y is actually s plus n and angle bracket s comma psi is going to be Therefore, what you are going to realize is that under u, this is going to be at norm s, this is 0, this is going to be norm s upon 2 and the variance is just sigma square. So effectively what you are doing is you are scaling the whole problem by norm s. 
Now there is a small advantage over here. Not it's a, you know you are going to get if you find the probability of symbol error, you will get the same result as the one you got in S, which makes complete sense. Except that over here you can make the conclusion that this distance, which is norm S, divided by two times the standard deviation of the noise is the entry in your queue. So if you remember your no, your PE you found to be under of course equiprobable signaling was norm s upon 2 sigma. That is if you find the distance between the two means, okay, if you define the distance between the two means of those which basically correspond to the actual values being sent because if you send 0 you are sending 0, if you send s of t you are sending norm s. The distance between those in this particular axis is norm s divided by 2 sigma. In the case of z, right, if you remember or if you remember from the previous lecture, in the case of z, you had 0 and norm s square as the mean and the variances were, the variance under the noise was sigma norm s square. If you do the same thing, find the distance between these two and divide by root of the variance, you will get norm s square by 2 times the noise of variance, 2 times sigma norm s, this is same as the previous. So what you can see is that I took inner product z comma s, but if you take inner product z comma psi also or any scaled version of s, you will get the same result. The only minor advantage with taking inner product of uh, you know uh, y comma psi is that you will get a number that is automatically scaled for this norm s. There is no other difference, but this is just a useful thing to know that the choice of in an angle bracket y comma s was not unique any scaled version of s will give you the exact same correct result yeah so now we will now move on to a more general form of binary signaling uh, that is the case where you have two signals s0 and s1 in this case also you have to be very careful because as just because i write s0 s1 doesn't mean that uh, automatically mean that there are two dimensions for example Suppose my S0 is something like psi1 and S1 is minus psi1 or 4 psi1 or something like that. So in this case the dimension can be at least 1 or at most 2 depending on your choice of S0 and S1. We are now going to just look at the general situation, general scenario in this case and like I mentioned earlier you can take the inner product with other signals which are related to S0 and S1 also. I am just going to analyze by taking the inner product with S0 and S1 much like we took the inner product with S in the on off case. So let us look at this particular scenario. So I am just going to write this in a general way. Let us say general binary signaling. If you look at the general binary signaling this is general okay you have y of t is s0 of t plus n of t y of t is s1 of t plus n of t that is if you send heads if you have if you send 0 s0 of t is transmitted if you send s1 s1 of t is transmitted no prizes for guessing if you set S0 to the 60 signal you get the same thing back as you did in the previous situation where you did on off. Let us now just understand in this case using the exact same tools how to find out the optimal decision region and so on. Okay? So in this case also there is almost no difference. Let us take a inner product of y comma S0. Okay? My and you know okay minus norm s0 square by 2. Why? Because this was our decision criterion. If you remember, you took norm y minus si square, you wanted to minimize it, you expanded it, removed the norm y square and took the negative sign, you wanted to maximize this quantity. Similarly, you have to find out the better one among these okay better one meaning the one that is larger okay so you have to find the argmax that is 
if in an angle bracket y comma s0 minus norm s square s0 square by 2 is larger then conclude that 0 was sent if angle bracket y comma s1 minus norm s square by 2 was smaller sorry was larger conclude that s1 was sent it's very simple or if you don't like this you just do this i think i need a new page alternately you find the minimum of or arg minimum of that is it minimum distance. Now, in this case also you can actually let us say call this particular you know you can also call these particular variables as z let us say that you know z is equal to under hypothesis h0 z is equal to angle bracket y comma s0 ok. If z is angle bracket y comma s0 then let us find the expectation of z under h0 very easy that is going to be expectation of under h0 what is y s s0 plus n ok I should not have done that s0 plus n comma s0 and I am not going into the full details actually I should have done covariance let me just no it is expectation fine. So, I am not going into the full details this is going to be norm s0 square. Similarly, variance of z given h0 not surprisingly is covariance of now here you have to just be very careful under hypothesis h0 what is y s0 plus n. So, I am going to write s0 plus n s0 plus n sorry s0 and comma s0 plus n s0. Now, needless to say if you expand this the s0 square comes out and you are going to get this to be ok. And if you do the similar for the other one you will get something similar and you know you have to just work it out typically you choose norm s0 square as norm s1 square. So, that stops mattering and you end up you know just uh, getting a much simpler uh, decision region. But in this case um, you know let us actually not go through the full evaluation, but let us just say that you know if you do this if you do the full maths and if you just get, you know get back like for example, if you want to make a decision then the decision region is going to be given by. So, let us just look at our slide over here. So, inner product y comma s0 minus norm s0 square by 2 is it greater than or less than inner product y comma s1 minus norm s1 square by 2. If you now simplify it by taking the s0 and s1 to each other sides you will get angle bracket y comma s1 minus s0 you just have to check whether it is more or less than norm s1 square by 2 minus norm s0 square by 2. This is going to be your decision region. Now, there is an intuition over here because if you start evaluating the probability of symbol error in this case you end up getting q of norm of s1 minus s0 by 2 sigma that is this is q of d by 2 sigma where d can be considered as the distance between your pair of signals s0 and s1. This again satisfies our intuition because in the previous exercise where you used on off signaling your s0 is s0 was essentially 0 and there you had q of norm s which is s1 or s by 2 sigma. Therefore, this q of d upon 2 sigma is a very effective kind of thing to know I mean it is a good sanity check to remember whenever you have binary signaling under Gaussian noise the optimal detector will have a probability of symbol error of q of d upon 2 sigma where sigma is the variance of the noise and d is the distance between these two signals. When I say distance between these two signals you have to evaluate norm of s0 minus s1 that is d. Now, in this scenario what is important is that this is true only when you have equiprobable signaling because we are doing ml 
and ML is same as MPE under equiprobable signaling. If it is not, then you have to be very careful. The decision region is going to shift. You can see that as an exercise. So this is something that can be worked out. I am not doing the full evaluation over here. But the key idea is once you have these two Gaussians, I am just going to, you know, uh, once you have these two Gaussians and you have to find out where this greater than less than equality occurs, that is going to be your decision region. That is going to give you the point at which you have to make a decision. So that is the key idea. It will typically be at the midpoint if you have S0s and S1s well chosen. That is the way to look at it. Now, in the general binary signaling, you have Q of D upon 2 sigma. This will serve as a recipe for MNA signaling also. So let us see. So with binary signaling, S0 and S1 can be assumed to correspond to the bits 0 and 1. We have not exactly discussed the aspect of how much energy we are consuming. So if we define energy as, uh, you know, from your uh, basic circuits, you know that whenever you have a signal, if you integrate that signal from 0 to T and square of the signal, that is like the energy contained in the signal between 0 and T. So if you now integrate the square of the signal, which is what we are doing when we write norm as 0, S0's energy is integral S0 square of T, S1 signal is integral S1 square of T and we send these two signals equiprobably because we have zeros occurring half of the times, ones occurring half of the times. We have had this discussion and we are going with equiprobable signaling. The EB or energy per bit can be defined as half norm S0 square plus norm S1 square. Norm S0 square, norm S1 square are the same as integral S square of T dt, integral S1 square of T dt and so on. Now, there is an interesting conclusion that occurs. If you look at the symbol error rate or bit error rate in binary signaling, both are same. With sigma square is equal to N0 by 2, I mentioned the choice of N0 by 2 because of the fact that we want N0 by 2 as the noise variance per dimension. The probability of error under maximum likelihood is Q of D upon 2 sigma, which is norm S1 minus S0 upon 2 sigma. We can write this as Q of root of D square by EB into EB by 2 N0. Okay. This is something interesting because EB by N0 is like an SNR quantity. It is like the bitwise SNR. It is the SNR per bit, so to speak. And this D square by EB can be considered as something called power efficiency. That is, this d square by eb serves as something like a power efficiency. What does this mean? Intuitively, let us say we go back to our situation of, uh, let us say, binary signaling with 0 being 0, then the average energy you spend is norm s1 square by 2. How do you increase d? If you keep increasing s1, to make it go farther and farther from 0 or a 0, then your energy increases. But the fact that you are making S1 go farther and farther intuitively means that the amplitude of S1 has to go higher and higher. The moment the amplitude of S1 goes higher and higher, you are spending more energy, more joules or if you want to look at it as joules per second, more power is being spent. Therefore, increasing D has a cost. That is your so-called constellation, your arrangement of these S0, S1, S2, if you make them really far apart, you are going to get great performance because your bit terror rate is going to go very close to 0. But at what cost? You are spending a lot of energy. The other thing is SNR per bit or SNR effectively, the signal to noise ratio is what determines your performance, not the signal power or the noise power alone. In other words, if you have a very low amount of noise, you can get away with just a very small amount of signal power to get the same bit error rate. Let me give you an example. Let us say that you have a communication system where you need a bit error rate of let us say 10 power minus 9. If the noise variance is 1, let us say that the amount of signal power you need is let us say some uh, in some scenario let us say that it is 100 joules or something like that. If the noise variance reduces to 0.1, you may need only 10 joules noise variance reduces to 0 0.01, you need only 1 joule, which basically goes to show that signal power and noise power 
individually are not the quantities that determine the performance of your communication system. It is the ratio that determines it. To give you a practical example, let's say that you are performing a kind of communication which is within a very narrow frequency band and the amount of noise that affects your signal is actually really, really small because it's a narrow frequency band. Unfortunately, your signaling also has to be on this narrow frequency band. So, if the amount of noise is small, the amount of signal will also be small for the same kind of bit error rate. But let's suppose that you are now dealing in a situation where there is a very high amount of noise because the environment essentially has lots of radiation and things like that. To overcome this kind of signaling, so to overcome this kind of noise, you need to send at a higher and higher power. So if you think about what, you know, let's say you are sending across the room, you may need some amount of power. But let's say that you are actually sending it to a satellite, which is several tens or sometimes hundreds of kilometers away, you may need a higher amount of no, uh, you know, power to overcome the noise that you incur. This is something to keep in mind. So SNR, signal to noise ratio, is what determines your performance. D square by EB is power efficiency because the higher the D is, the more the power you are consuming. So having a lower D is great in the sense of you being very power efficient, but you have to map, match your whatever your you know, bit error rate requirement is. That is key. <coughs> So sticking to binary signaling, because once you understand binary signaling, MRA signaling is a just an extension of this. I mentioned that the dimension of your signaling can be at least one, at most two. So for example, this particular signaling is what we saw just now, it's on off keying, where you place your S0 at 0 and you place your S1 at 1. So in this case, you saw that the Q is, you know, Q is basically enormous by uh, 2 sigma, norm S1 by 2 sigma in this particular notation, okay. But you can also put your signals in different you know, locations. For example, S0 and S1 are orthogonal. Can you think of an example of binary orthogonal signaling? So there are many. So for example, let's say that this is my S0, this is my S1. You can obviously see, I mean, assuming this is 1, this is 0, this is 1, this is, let's say, 1, minus 1, uh, this is minus 1, 0, half, 1, and so on. You end up getting it that this is actually an example of two signals that are orthogonal. In this case, if you choose the basis for vectors carefully, remember I gave you an intuitive way. This can be 1, 1, this can be 1, minus 1. It's very evident that these are orthogonal. In this particular situation, I am not choosing those. I am using actually the this is 0, half and 1. So I am using these. So in this case, 1, 0, 0, 1. So this is basically the vector 1, 0. This is the vector 0, 1. So these two are orthogonal signals. And the case where you use orthogonal signals, you end up, in the case where you have orthogonal signals, you end up getting a constellation like this and this kind of constellation gives you again some uh, you know a different error performance depending on how far s0 s1 are from the origin and things like that and the detector also will have slight differences of course your recipe of taking angle bracket y comma zero angle bracket y1 that doesn't change but the actual implementation mechanics may change this antipodal is very very interesting the reason antipodal is very interesting is because it's just like an extension of the on-off keying, but over here you have these signals at S0 and S1 and uh, typically equally far away from the origin. In this case, what is the dimension of signaling? If you think about it carefully, you will find that this is the case where the dimension is exactly 1, just like in the on-off keying and it's very easy, you choose this signal you choose this signal or anything else, you know, you choose a triangle, you choose a sink, whatever. That is a signal and negative of that is the other signal. Now, in the case of binary, there is something nice which happens. If you sit and write the detector in an angle bracket y comma is 0, y comma is 1 and do all those things, you will get something very neat. You will find that under equally probable signaling, the decision region is just to the left or right of 0 
and you just have to take the sign S i g n sign of that z which you get by taking angle bracket y comma s1. So if you find angle bracket y comma s1, if it is positive s1, negative s0, that's it. So in this particular case also, you have a very neat way of performing the detection where you just have positive and negative of the z giving you the answer. And again, q of root of, uh, sorry, q of uh, you know, d upon 2 sigma will give you the error. This is something that you can check out. So one thing you can check is what is the average energy usage for each of these cases. Turning our eye towards MRE signaling, the ML rule for MRE signaling doesn't undergo much change. It's delta ML of y is arg min zi, y is, runs from 1 to m minus 1, where zi is angle bracket y si minus norm si square by 2. No difference except that there are more than two SIs. That's the only difference. And you can also just find distances. For example, you can write this as arg min DIs, where DIs are norm Y minus SIs. This is like just saying, find me that particular signal point that is the least Euclidean distance, least square, you know, least distance in terms of coefficient sum squared from the actual point that I sent. That's basically it. So the key idea is that you have the space of all received signals y, you can just partition them into various parts that map to one of these SIs. And using that you can also easily look at the geometry and predict the symbol error rates. For example, for PAM4, let us say that our signal, this is one dimensional signaling, so I just have y's and uh, s's are, one, you know, my y is one dimension, s0, s1, s2, s3 are all you know, just scaled versions of the same thing, minus 3, minus 1, 1, 3. Optimal decision regions to the left of minus 2, to the right of minus 2, left of minus 2 is minus 3, right of minus 2 is minus 1. Similarly, left of minus 1, sorry, left of 0 is minus 1, right of 0 is plus 1. Left of 2 is 1, right of 2 is 3. The only catch, slight catch here is that, you know, I mean, actually finding the symbol error rate is very easy. For example, for 3, it is, you just have to place a Gaussian over here and then the error is basically the probability you lie in this area, which is great. But the only catch is that when you want to find the symbol error rate for 1, you have to take this part and this part. So remember that you will get a combination of Qs. Similarly, for u minus 1, although if you use equiprobable signaling and everything, you don't need to redo because this will be the same as minus 1 for 1 and finally for minus 3 and 3 it will be same. The only thing you have to keep in mind is that there are for 3 and minus 3 you can use the q directly. For 1 and minus 1 you just have to use two q's because it can either go to this side or that side. So you have to be careful. This is an exercise that you should perform. For QPSK it is interesting. Okay, The decision regions are this part, this part, this part, this part. Why? Because if you look, if you are standing here, if this is where the received signal is, obviously this is the closest. But if you now slightly stray here, this is the closest. So in between these two, this is the decision region. In between these two, this is the decision region. In this case, you can actually think of this as uh, depending on which way you look at it. If you look at it as real, it is two dimensional. If it is complex, it is one dimensional. But looking at it as a combination of real signals makes it easy. You have to decide whether you are above the x-axis or below the x-axis. You have to decide whether you are to the left of the x-axis, to the right of the x-axis. This leads to something interesting when you think about how bits are assigned. So, for example, if you do a bit assignment like this, let's say 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 0. I deliberately did this. You see, the bit 0 is common on the top part. The bit 1 is common on the bottom part. So, checking the whether you are above or below the x-axis, gives you an idea about this particular bit, the, the uh, most significant bit. Similarly, the least significant bit is same to the left of the y-axis and to the same to the right of the y-axis. So, checking whether you are to the left or right of the y-axis gives you addition on the, um, you know, gives you an idea of the addition on the least significant bit. So, in fact, one important relationship that you will see is that QPSK is actually two BPSKs in disguise when you look at it in the bit picture. And this is something that you will work out and we will see also in the future classes. So 
to summarize in the past several lectures, we have gone into detail to check how demodulation works and how demodulation can be used for, uh, you know, detecting the signals that were sent. We first saw that it is enough to project the received signals onto the modulation signal space size and in general the detection transforms the identifying region you know the detection problem transforms to identifying the region in which the received vector lies this is a natural consequence of the optimal decision being the optimal decision being finding out from where you have the uh, minimum distance so for example for qpsk you saw that this particular region corresponded to this being the minimum distance so finding out where your y lies on that screen or on that region will automatically partition your decision region into various spaces under maximum likelihood detection under additive white Gaussian noise, the minimum distance decoding is optimal. The same is uh, true for minimum probability of error under equiprobable signaling. You know, when you have equiprobable symbols, MPE and ML are the same. In the further thoughts, we, we, you know, before we, you know, we'll just do a GNU radio exercise and then come back to what happens at the bit level. So symbols are fine, but what happens when you start putting bits? I gave you an example of QPSK, but what about general signaling? How do you find bit errors? Because everyone who does digital signal, digital communication is talking about bit errors. So how do bit errors occur and how do we characterize bit errors rather than symbol errors? That will be something which we will see subsequently. So in the next few lectures, we will have GNU radio related work related to this. Thank you.